We'll be starting, we want to be cognizant of everyone's time. It's about five minutes after seven. So we're going to begin very, very shortly. We'll ask everyone to grab a seat. Um, it looks like we may need a few more chairs. Um, we'll, we'll see if we could work. There's some more available chairs on the side here for those of you coming in. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. If I could have your attention, if I could ask. Yeah, it's on. It's on. We have it. Good evening. Once again, if I could ask for everyone's attention, if I could kindly ask those of you joining us to take a seat so that we may begin. All right, so today is Thursday, November 17th, and we are ready to have our Zoning and Land Use Committee meeting for Community Board 10. This evening, we have one item on our agenda. The Zalup Committee will be reviewing a special permit application to reduce the parking requirement for existing affordable independent residences for seniors, buildings located at 9000 Shore Road, Shore Hill, pursuant to section 73434 of the zoning resolution in order to facilitate construction of a new heirs building on the premises within an R7A zoning district and the special Bay Ridge district. I am happy to be joined here tonight by our Zoning and Land Use Committee. Our Zoning and Land Use Committee Chair Doris Cruz could not make it this evening. My name is Jane Marie Kapsanakis. I'm Chair of Community Board 10 and happy to be with you tonight. Thank you. Now, we know that this is a very important issue and we are delighted to see so many members of our community have come out because this is important to them. And so before we begin, I just would like to review our order of the meeting. I will be providing an introduction. Then we turn to the applicant to present to us. After the applicant presents, then our committee has the opportunity to ask questions and to speak. After the committee asks their questions and speaks, then it is the opportunity for the public to offer their comments and speak as well. We have yellow sheets in the back for members of the public who would like to sign up to speak. Should I use my cafeteria voice? No, because the live stream will hear it then. All right. I'll get you. <laughs> All right. So, when it is time for the public members to come up to speak, once again, if you would like that opportunity, please fill out a yellow sheet. We have Dorothy Garuccio here from our community board. She will be making sure to collect those sheets so that we have them up here at the front, and you'll be called up to offer your comments. Now, I, I know that you're here because this is something you feel strongly about, but I have to also ask your patience and cooperation as we go through the procedure of the meeting. All right? So I appreciate that. So this way when we're hearing the presentation, we can all hear it. And when our committee is discussing the issues and having their questions, you can hear what they have to say too. So of course, why are we here? Well, Community Board 10 Zoning and Land Use Committee is here to review this presentation being made on behalf of RAHF Shore Hill LLC. RAHF Shore Hill LLC, the applicant, is seeking a Board of Standards and Appeals BSA special permit 
and a City Planning Commission CPC minor modification to an existing large-scale residential plan. Now this has another set of initials, LSRD, so all those initials are going to come up in their presentation for you. The proposed actions are needed to facilitate the development of a new approximately 107,000 gross square foot residential building with 137 units affordable senior housing. The proposed project would be nine stories tall, 95 feet, and front on Colonial Road. In addition to senior housing, the building would contain 3,400 general square feet of accessory social and welfare facilities. The Board of Standards and Appeals special permit application is to reduce parking on this site that is a large-scale development constructed in 1977. Today the site has two L-shaped buildings containing 14 stories with a total of 557 units, a one-story community facility building, and rear open space and parking lot. The BSA special permit application seeks to reduce the number of parking spaces from 112 to 56 off-street parking spaces. We do not have an advisory review of the CPC modification. However, the CPC modification is conditioned and dependent upon the Board of Standard and Appeals approval of the special permit to reduce the parking to 56 parking spaces. And now I would like to introduce our applicant, Andrew Foley from Jonathan Rose Developer will be speaking this evening. Please welcome him. Uh, thank you all for, for coming tonight. Um, uh, on behalf of uh, the, the community management team, I just want to welcome you here. We're, we're delighted to have you and, and host you for this meeting. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm, my name is Andrew Foley. I'm Associate Director of Development at Jonathan Rose Companies. I'm the, the lead developer for this project. Um, and so we're here tonight to talk about uh, our proposal to develop a, a new 137-unit, uh, all-affordable senior housing project in the uh, parking lot right over there, uh, and also uh, pr uh, pr put forward some really, uh, we think, amazing improvements to the site overall. So we were uh, with you, uh, I believe many of you tuned in in May when we first came before uh, the Land Use Committee to uh, share our, our proposal. And so you'll see tonight we're going to You'll see some of what I'm going to say is going to be, for those of you who are tuned in, a little bit of repeat, but um, we're going to try to get as quickly into some of the substantive points that you raised at the last meeting, uh, because we think you raised a lot of uh, really good points that uh, deserve our attention. So uh, this is the agenda for tonight. Uh, I'll give a brief project overview. We're then going to get into some of the initial feedback that you gave um, in May and what we've been doing to work to address some of your concerns, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle Campanella, uh, the community manager uh, here at uh, Shore Hill. Uh, we have Brian Toos, our project architect from Curtis Ginsburg and Ar Architects, and Timothy Lavin, our civil engineer, who works on things like stormwater and, and traffic, uh, which I know a lot of your concerns, we've asked him to join us as well. So you all found your way here, so you know where we are. Um, it just Here's a neighborhood map. You know, we just pointing out we've um, the our site here in red. Um, about a 15-minute walk or so, depending on how fast you walk, uh, to the two uh, subway stations that serve the R. The, this site is also uh, fortunate to have really great uh, bus access uh, uh, right uh, right here uh, along Shore Road. Uh, this is the site. Uh, I think there was a great uh, description of the project before uh, by the community board chair, so I'll, I'll skip that. So we're here tonight. We'll talk about our building, right? Uh, we want to build more affordable senior housing. There is an affordability crisis in, in our city and across the country and few spots to build new housing. Uh, but we also want to talk just briefly about some of the other site-wide improvements that we're going to make in addition to the new building. So 
This is the existing plan for the, for the site. There's actually a poster of it over there if you want to take a closer look. Um, you know, this is a project that was built in 19, you know, in, in the mid-70s, approved in 1974. Um, and, you know, we believe there's a lot of opportunity to improve it for our residents. There's areas that weren't built for people in wheelchairs, and so there's opportunities to expand seating, to activate spaces that are, I think, beautiful opportunities to, to, to make them more active spaces, but it's fairly underutilized. So this is the entry between the two buildings on 91st Street. Um, there's also a number of really great open spaces throughout the, the site that don't get used a lot by our residents, and part of that is that they're not accessible. You could see here, there's, two sta there's a stair right there and a stair right there, but it's very difficult for our residents to actually get down to a, a beautiful open space like that, so as a result, it's not very well utilized. Um, here's another, this is actually the courtyard on the other side here, where again, you actually have to get downstairs in order to sit and, and enjoy these open spaces, and we think there's a really great opportunity to improve open space to connect our residents to nature. And then there's our parking, uh, our, our, our trash uh, dumpsters. Um, you know, this building, when it was built, didn't have a, think a lot about how to manage the refuse, and so as a result, you, I think you've all seen it if you drive by. You know, we have uh, open air dumpsters, which we don't think are great for everybody, and so you'll see us present a little bit on our solution for the uh, trash as well tonight. And then there's the parking lot. We know a lot of you are here to talk about the parking. We understand that. Um, we'll talk about how our numbers are showing it, it's an it's a underutilized parking lot uh, for our residents and our neighbors, and we think, we understand everybody wants to see, you know, would like more parking, but we think it's a, it's a reasonable trade-off to build more affordable housing on this underutilized parking lot. So we'll, we'll get into that. Don't, try, don't worry, we'll, we'll talk plenty about that. Um, so this is just a review. You've got the east, west courtyard, east courtyard, and the community courtyard between the two buildings. This is how, what it looks like today with 73 spaces of, of parking along Colonial. And this is what we're proposing to do. So you can see we're proposing to build the building um, on the parking lot, 137 units. We are proposing a centralized trash compacting area uh, to, um, uh, to protect and just have a better, more efficient uh, trash, trash and refuse plan. Um, we are providing 56 parking spaces, and I'll talk a little bit more about why 56 is, is the magic number. And then we're doing um, considerable improvements to the three main courtyards and areas around 91st Street as well. And for those of you who tuned in in May, we had our landscape architect here who, who went into a lot of detail about all the things we plan to do on the landscape front. I'm just going to abbreviate that because I know we've got other things to talk about. But uh, he, uh, before I do that, he, here's the building. Our architect, Brian, is going to talk a little bit more about the building and the mass. Uh, but as I mentioned, 137 units. Uh, these will be all affordable. Uh, the program we're going to utilize uh, is called uh, Senior Affordable Rental Apartments. It's a program that the city of New York offers to uh, build uh, affordable housing. The, the rules are it has to be avail uh, affordable to folks at or below 60% of area median income which is, you know, $50,000, $60,000 in annual income for the household unit, right? However, we're proposing to also to secure uh, project-based Section 8 vouchers, which ensure that all the residents only pay 30% of their income no matter what their income is, okay? And we'll talk more about that, but this will be truly affordable housing to, to seniors. Uh, the city also, in addressing um, the homelessness crisis, is requiring that all new affordable housing dedicate a portion to formerly ho uh, homeless households. And so there'll be 30% uh, of our units will, ha will be dedicated to uh, seniors who have uh, recently experienced homelessness, which is uh, clearly an, an issue that is impacting uh, the in country, but particularly here in New York as well. Um, so here's just a, a few glimpses of what we're proposing to do in these courtyards. Uh, we're looking to activate this area between the two buildings where there's a lot of great um, energy but for our residents with uh, community gardens, uh, gaming tables, places to sit. As I mentioned, we have one, the courtyard right behind this wall is currently not accessible to our residents because they can't get to it. So we're actually going to create this ramp that, that allows somebody in a wheelchair to actually make their, all their way down here and enjoy 
you know, a quiet place. This is a place for contemplation, uh, a place where uh, somebody can get away and read a book, talk with um, friends. And then on the other side, which is out that door, some of you came through that side, we're actually going to uh, increase the grade so that we've got more surface area to do more active type programming. So we envision, you know, outdoor uh, lunches, uh, barbecue type events, outdoor uh, workouts, um, uh, movie nights. Uh, but we, we think that this is you know, there's, so, there's such little open space in, in, in the community, and we think there's a lot of underutilized space here that we are looking forward to improving. So uh, let's talk a little bit about zoning and why we're here. I think the chair did a great job of explaining what brings us here tonight. Um, but a little background on the zoning for this, uh, this project. So this building, these, these two buildings, Shore Hill, were, were built as part of a special permit in 1974, okay? Uh, I've talked to several residents who were, who were here back when that was originally proposed. We understand that that was a controversial proposal. It was originally proposed to be 22 stories. It brought a lot of people out. A lot of people were upset about the height. Uh, these buildings were eventually reduced down to 14 stories, which is what exists today. And as part of that, there was a, um, a special permit that, per that uh, permitted some minor uh, tweaks to what was allowed by zoning. There was no height increases uh, granted, no density increases. It was things like, uh, you know, the setback between the buildings, so, some minor things as part of this special permit. In 1978, there was a rezoning that happened that um, created the, the, the Bay, Bay Ridge Special District, which zoned a portion of this site to R31. And then in 2005, fast forwarding, there was a rezoning that it rezoned the other portion of the neighborhood plus our site to R7A. Now that rezoning took what was, would, would have allowed you know, 14 story buildings and put a height cap to nine stories. Um, and then in 2016, and you, many of you probably remember that because it wasn't that long ago, uh, there was a, uh, a zoning change called Zoning for Quality and Affordability, ZQA, that really uh, rewrit a lot of, rewrote a lot of the zoning code to promote affordable housing, okay? Part of that plan reduced the parking requirements for uh, uh, low-income senior housing, okay? So that change uh, reduced the parking requirement for existing senior housing to 10% of the units. So once one parking stall for every 10 units, okay? Uh, so, uh, and it, it, it allowed for buildings that were already built to seek a, uh, a special permit to bring the current parking, requ the parking requirements that were built, the project was built under, to the new requirement. But the, the zoning said, we want the, the Board of Standards of Appeals to review it and give the community board an opportunity to weigh in. So that's really what brings us here today. Uh, so we are... Um, as was mentioned by the chair, we have filed a special permit with the Board of Standards of Appeals uh, to do, reduce the re parking required for the existing buildings down to uh, what's required today under current zoning. We're not asking for uh, a waiver on parking that's that below what is required today under current zoning. Uh, and our new building, because it is, uh, uh, it requires fewer than 15 parking spaces, uh, there's, a, there's a, a waiver that says you don't have to provide that if you're providing all affordable housing, okay? So that gets us back to the magic number of 56. So the, the, the 73 parking spaces that are being reduced to 56 reflect the, um, the, the parking that is required uh, by current zoning for the existing Shore Hill buildings, okay? Um, and so, when we spoke to this body in uh, May, we got a lot of really good feedback, okay? And so we really want to spend most of our time tonight talking about some of the concerns you raised in May. Uh, so you talked about the concern about the sewer and, and water pooling up. And uh, we heard that loud and clear, and we've heard from, from many of you tonight that that remains a big issue. So uh, we've invited uh, Tim Lavin, our civil engineer, to talk about our approach to stormwater. Uh, we also heard some concerns expressed, particularly from the folks on this side, about the new compactors that are being proposed. So we'll talk a little bit about trash. 
And then um, we heard some comments about our design and kind of why does the building have to be the, you know, the shape it is in. Uh, so uh, our architect, Brian Toos, it will uh, go through our approach to the, the building envelope and address some of the specific uh, points that you made in May. And then we'll get to parking. So hang in with us, but we'll talk about, uh, we did a study to show the utilization of the parking. We'll go through that. And then from there, we'll open it up to questions to the, uh, to the committee and then take your questions and comments. Okay, so first up, let's talk about this, the sewer impacts of our new project, and so I'll welcome up uh, Tim Lavin from AKRF. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone. Um, good evening. So I'm here to talk about how the stormwater uh, requirements by the city uh, and how the development is going to impact the surrounding uh, the site area and the surrounding environment. So briefly, <clears throat> currently what's happening is, I mean, we've got our site, the two existing buildings, the parking lot, the all of the stormwater is collected through a series of pipes around the site. It's collected into a, a series of pipes that are in the existing parking lot and it all discharges to Colonial Avenue. So. We, we understand that there's an issue on, or Colonial Road, excuse me. Uh, we understand there's an issue with stormwater on Colonial Road, so as part of the project development, we are going to improve things with our new site project. We are going to move all of that stormwater for the existing site into the new parking area, which is behind this uh, building over there. And we're going to divert that over to 91st Street with similar outflow to the way it's happening today. It's lower the... We're going to lower the, the amount of water that's leaving the site for the entire property. So <clears throat> everything will be collected in a piping system and it'll go into the sewer. So the new building development is also going to incorporate a, a significant amount of green space that's going to reduce the amount of stormwater that's leaving the property altogether. We are also looking at uh, possibilities of permeable pavement in the, in the site to reduce, further reduce runoff leaving the property. And we'll have a, a very small detention system for the building and the new part of the site that will connect back to Colonial Road. However, I want to point out that the site development area, there's, there's some numbers and I don't want to get too technical, but the, the point will be, uh, at the end of the, the slide, it'll be clear. Um, the site development area for the new building is 44,000 square feet. Um, there's very little landscape coverage in that. It's very, very minor. So what we're going to do, and, oh, and the, the total amount of runoff that leaves the property is 0.68 CFS, and it all goes to Colonial. So, <clears throat> sorry, um, the all of the runoff that's leaving the property is it, it's a number 0.68 cubic feet per second as it runs out to Colonial Avenue, and that includes 100% of the site today. So, what we're doing with our proposed development is we are uh, reducing the imperfect the impervious coverage significantly from 40,000 square feet of parking to 22,000 square feet. The landscape coverage is nearly doubling, so that's further reducing the amount of water leaving the, road, leaving the, the site. And because of the new stormwater requirements by the, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, we need to significantly reduce all of the runoff leaving the property by code. So that's reducing our number from 0.68 to 0.09 CFS which is an overall reduction of 85% of water as it leaves the property. And that we're doing everything that we possibly can to address the amount of runoff that leaves this property. We're sticking within the, the code requirements and we're providing as much green space as possible so that there's less runoff leaving the property than there is today. So that'll improve what's happening in Colonial Road, in 91st Street, and in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, so now moving on to the trash compactors. Um, currently, the way the site is set up, there are open areas where trash collects, there are open dumpsters, open tops. It's, in my opinion, it's rather unsightly. It's not the best way to manage refuse in the site. Uh, Andrea had mentioned that earlier as well. So 
what's happening today. You have lots of bins that need to get moved around. You need lots of space for them to be moved around in, so that takes up some of the parking spaces as well. The bins need to be cleaned and maintained. Sometimes they break, sometimes they don't work. They're open at the top, and as the, the, the truck collects the refuse from the bin, there's a potential for things to spill out all over the place and make a bigger mess. So, in accordance with the new Department of Sanitation requirements, we need to put in what's called a roll-on, roll-off container. So all of the refuse is contained in a closed bin. Um, it has a higher capacity. It incorporates a compactor, so it gets things crushed in, into smaller spaces. Um, the containers require fewer people and fewer trucks, so that's less of an impact on the environment overall. Um, I mentioned the compaction already. They are self-contained and sealed, so there's um, less things that are spilling out all over the, the site outside of the containers. Um, and because the, it's a sealed container, you can't overstuff them. Like the open containers, you see things sometimes spilling out over the top. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Brian to talk about the building massing and design. Thank you, Tim. So, yeah, we're going to just uh, start running through, uh, we'll start with some of the basics of the site, why the site, or why the building is located, how it is on the site, what the shape of the building is, and then get into some of the design features and how we approach that. Oh, I forgot that I'm the one that does this. Okay, so we've seen this already, just blow through this quickly. Uh, this is the building uh, facing Colonial Road. Um, you can see the existing buildings in the background and the narrows behind it. We'll come back to that. So one of the things that was brought up on our first meeting uh, was a question about um, maybe why couldn't more of the building be located further into the site or why is it ending up where it is precisely on the site today? So what we're going to talk about here is just a little brief overview of the zoning and how it ends up where it is. As you can see, you know, this is the property line of the existing Shore Hill site. Within that, we have the um, <clears throat> zoning district boundaries. Andrew mentioned there's an R31 to the north and south of the property, and one of those R31 district boundaries is inside of our site. So our building isn't going to be located in that portion of the site. It can't be. It can only be located in the R7A portion. Um, once you get the building, so the building's going to be located in sort of that triangle. Within that triangle, there are some uh, limitations and things that we need to keep in mind. Um, first of all, Side yard setbacks, so we'll start going through the A, B, C, D. So side yard setbacks is what we're looking at, the eight feet on the top portion of the site. We don't want to get close to that property line. We're going to, under any circumstance, stay away from that. B, we have special height limitations within 25 feet of that lower density district. Our building is going to stay five feet, or five stories or under, effectively. Um, and then because of that, you end up with, um, oh, beyond that C, is we can't go really much further back into the site because when you have multiple buildings on a zoning lot, you can't have them too close to each other. Um, so that sort of, you can see, it starts to limit where that triangle, it gets a little bit smaller. And the bulk of our building, the highest portion of it, then sort of falls in between that. And that's why the building ends up being located where it is. And then the last thing is the street wall and the setbacks, which I think we can better explain in the next diagram. So as you can see, this is a you know, prettier graphic and you can see what the building looks like um, as a diagram. You've also seen the aerial photographs and you can see there once again, the dark gray portions of the building are the five story portions. Those are, you know, be sort of be, trying to limit the height of the building so we don't want to be too high closer to the, the, that R31 district. Beyond that, we can see the rest of the building behind it and then the street wall is the medium gray portion of the building and so that's where, um, you know, that's our main facade for the building. We have to, <clears throat> at about 75 feet, roughly, we have to set back 10 feet. And then there is a, something called a dormer provision where portions of the building can uh, protrude among, a, a little bit above that. And that's one of the choices we've made to do that toward the center of the site to sort of really locate that mass of the building, um, you know, in that one portion. And right. So this is our street view of the building. As you can see, the lower portions of the wings of the building, um, the dormer, the street wall, and then the setback and the building beyond it. Um, so 
Now I want to talk about how we're you know, starting to articulate the building and um, add a little bit more interest to it and be sensitive to the street um, and streetscape. So the lower, you know, we're differentiating and breaking down the volumes with different colors and things. And one of the things that we're really doing here is the dormer portions of the building. So as the building steps down, it also steps back. Um, as, you know, as you go more to the north of the building, that creates the opportunity for more um, planting toward the sidewalk. It, uh, and also then gives us an opportunity to have more of a garden, the sort of a buffer between our neighbor to the north. Um, <clears throat> we're also looking at having a base to the building, and this is another thing we're trying to do to re relate to the scale of the rest of the property. So what we're, you know, what you see there is we have, you know, the the um, visitation academy wall across the street, and also the porches of the houses to the north. That that entrance to the building is going to relate in scale to that, um, that sort of pedestrian um, experience of walking down the street. Um, and then, you know, also you can see that we're, we want to be um, sensitive to and relate to the history and materiality of the neighborhood. So we're, you know, we have a lot of rich history of pre-war and mid-century uh, apartment buildings throughout the neighborhood. And that's really what we're looking at here when we've decided to design and then pick the palette for the building. So you have a lot of red brick. We're looking at our brick articulation and corbeling. Um, and then as we get up to the top of the building, we're using a stucco material that's lighter. It's going to make the building, um, you know, uh, reflect a little bit more light there and sort of recede into the background. And that's also a material that you see throughout the neighborhood, and especially some of these older um, Almost, uh, I think it's two to revival buildings that you'll see around the neighborhood. They have a similar sort of feature. So that's the palette that we're looking at uh, based on what's in the neighborhood. And just want to cap off one thing is we're looking at the streetscape. So at the top we have, this is again Colonial Road, north to the, um, I guess, your left and south to the right. And then also at the bottom we have a section through the site. And what we're showing here is the building in its context. Um, related to you. I think some of you also saw I mean, the model over here where you can see um, there are some smaller houses around it but there's also some larger buildings obviously the buildings that were uh, you know in front of us and behind me um, in addition to some of the apartments uh, further down Shore Road so you know we're, we're it's I guess I think it speaks for itself just to say that this is something we see throughout the neighborhood um, and feel that it's um, you know it kind of fits into that and it uh, so that's, I think, the end of my speech. <laughs> OK, let's talk about parking. Um, so uh, as, part of, as part of the review process to, to file for the special permit, uh, we have to study about impacts on a number of things. And one of the things is clearly, what is the impact on the reduction in parking that we're proposing? So uh, we hire a professional engineering firm, and there's a bunch of rules for how you study this. Um, and they did a study uh, in April of this year. Um, what they concluded is that um, the peak demand, meaning the most cars, they studied for a week, most cars uh, in the parking lot were 43 at any given time. That's day, night, and on Saturday, okay? The average demand, over that period of time was 38, okay? So their conclusion, which is part of the presentation that uh, the, the study that you have, is that even with our proposed 56 parking spaces, we're providing more than is currently needed by uh, our current building here, by our residents. We have uh, uh, two clinics, Columbia Doctors and NYU Rusk, as, as you know. Uh, they have some parking. And so uh, Michelle and her team administer this uh, parking program. And when a resident uh, has a way to request a decal for parking here, and so we asked just to see like, well, so what, it's been a while since we did this study, what, what's the current demand now? How many parking spaces um, are being used by our residents? And so these are the numbers. Uh, Oh, yeah. So, uh, so we, we're showing, th so 33 decals as of, this was November, I think, two 36. weeks. So it's 36. We got three more. So, so that's up to 44. And then we have eight decals for our, um, 
are, are two clinics, you know, four each, okay? So, yeah. So, you, so I hear a question about street parking as well. So we don't just study the parking on the current site, but we also see how, what's the demand for parking on the street surrounding the site, okay? So they actually go around and they serve, and they survey this. Hang on one second. Let me just get this through, then we'll, we'll hear from you. Um, they found that within uh, a quarter of a mile, which is about a five-minute walk from our site, during the week, midday, there's about 153 spaces available on the street. <laughs> Gentleman's asking about overnight parking. He's, he's correct. The overnight parking drops to about 53 spaces throughout. I live in Mid... No, I live in Midtown. Yeah. So how does this consultant study it? We We will continue to let them finish. We will continue to the committee meeting. We already have about 20 people who have signed up, and we will get to everyone. Thank you for your patience. We've been patient since May. And we've been here this evening trying to get Thank you once again. We're going to get through the order of the meeting. I appreciate your support and cooperation. Well, I th this might be a good time to open it up for questions. I think we're... And we have to go to the committee. Are you finished with your presentation? Uh, yes, we are. Thank you very much. Now we will continue. Thank you for your presentation. We'll continue now with our committee questions, and then we will be happy to continue with our questions from the uh, public. As I mentioned, if you would like to speak this evening, there are the yellow sheets in the back. We have about 20 that are already filled out. All right. So from our committee, would you like to begin? Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Stephen Harrison, and I am the former chair of the Zoning Committee and the former chair of Community Board 10. Uh, I'm listening, and I just have a few questions for you. Uh, CEQA and CE and CEQA SE, okay. Uh, is this on? Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. There's something called secret, and there's something called secret, another one, CEQRA. Have you done uh, uh, what has to be done for those? Yes. Okay. What have you done with respect to secret? Because what I'm he looking at here, okay, and I'm, I'm going to read this to you because this came from a, a, a legal filing okay. uh, that I'm aware of, and it says, an action subject to secret is carefully defined in law. Amongst other things, it includes policy regulations and procedure making, such as agency planning, policy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, okay? To determine if an EIS, and that's an environmental impact statement, correct? Have you done an environmental assessment statement yet? Uh, yes, we've okay. done an EIS. And, and they gave you a negative on that? They said you, you, you didn't have to do an EIS, is that correct? My understanding is that that's a conclusion of the of the process to do well, after they review what we've present what we've submitted as part of the EAS, which we've submitted to the Board of Standards and Appeals. Correct. They'll review that. I'm, to I'm, I'm saying it so that everybody can understand. Understood. That that's it. Yeah. Okay. So you did an EAS, but you haven't been told yet whether you have a negative deck or whether in fact you can go. F you have to go forward with an EIS, right? Correct. Yeah. That's okay. the, that's how the process. Works. All right. Now, just. Speaking generally, okay, I'm not, yeah. not going to get into things because I know how technical EIS, EAS can get, mm -hmm. but would you agree with me that to determine if an EIS is necessary, the agency must determine 
the significance of any environmental impact. Correct? Just generally speaking. Yeah. No, okay. That's a fair statement. And it says, for unlisted actions, an EIS is mandatory if, among other things, one can anticipate a substantial adverse change in air quality. Correct? <laughs> yes. Okay. Correct. And it w the impairment of existing community or neighborhood character, correct? Isn't that considered in there? Correct. Okay. Now, with respect to this particular, are you saying to the people that are here that this would not have an effect or a significant effect on the neighborhood character? Yes. Does anybody here agree with that? No. Okay. All right. I just, I just want to understand. All right. So you've decided, you, you, do you live here, incident? Anybody here? Anybody live around here? No. I just want to know if you do, do. You live here? No, I do not live in Bay Ridge. And, and around this area, do you, because you're saying that you you hired some people to come in here that you paid, who mm -hmm. made a determination that this would not have a significant environmental impact, correct? Correct. And that it has no effect or no significant effect on community character. Is that correct? So is that correct? Is that what you did? Yes or no? Yes. I mean, it's a very simple question. Yes. Okay. So yep. you've determined with the people that you've paid to come over and to assess this that the parking is great and that it's not going to affect the community character, correct? Yep. And none of you live here, right? Just want to know. Correct. Okay. Now, next thing it says, uh, I, I said there, that's the, the impairment of existing community or neighborhood character a crea cre or a creation of a human hazard to health, a substantial change in the use of the land or its capacity to support an existing use. Now, I'll put them all together there, okay? This is about health, all right? Do you know anything about the sewers around here for these people? Do you have problems with sewers back here? Okay, okay. What, did your, what, was, your, what was your conclusion on that? I'd just like to know. Yeah, and so, Tim, do you want to um, just paraphrase the... Your conclusion the, was... On I'm the just, sewers. I don't, I don't want to go through a whole thing. Well, if, if you want to ask well, me a question... You, it's, my, you, you, it's my time right okay. now, okay? All right, fair. All right, what I'm asking you... What I'm asking you, okay, is do you have, uh, I mean, when it came to the sewers, we talked with you just recently, it was almost like you didn't even consider the sewers here, okay? Do we have, I mean, does anybody have problems with sewers here? I mean, like when it floods or anything like that? All right, now you're going to be adding huge building with how many units in it? 137. How many toilets? Okay, I mean, you're getting my drift here. And you're saying that this is not going to have an effect on the people in this community? I have to respectfully disagree. Thank you. Leo Dan, may I ask you to come up because there's yes. a flyer for Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess my comments are going to be short and I'm going to be specific specifically speaking about the parking and the issues that you guys are bringing up. Uh, my first question, just to reiterate, per zoning, the project complies not only with massing, but your guys are complying with the number of parking stalls that you're proposing to provide for the project. I'm saying that I'm trying to reiterate if the project complies with the number of parkings by zoning today. All right. Correct. So my recommendation to the design team and to the project team will be to, since your project complies with absolutely everything in terms of massing, parking. But what about the parkings in the new building? That complies. The, please. Trying to be good neighbors. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like what everyone is here today about is um, this is a matter of like being a good neighbor. Your project complies, your, your parking complies. Try to provide more parking because as a lot of people that live in this neighborhood, including myself, even though zoning says that you can provide less parking. Zoning from No, zoning from today, sir says that you can provide less parking, trying to be a good neighbor and understand that there's issues parking around for people that don't have parking in their homes and rely on street parking, for the employees that work in the development, 
and that would add strain to the existing development. So consider that in trying to accommodate more parking into your project as a way of being a good neighbor. Right. Second issue that has been brought up is with storm drain, civil engineering did a presentation how they're thinking about accommodating the, the, the subcharge and alleviating. I ask you again as trying to be a good neighbor, upsize the cisterns for the retention on, on the site that will probably add money to your project, but on the long time, in the long, in other words, trying to be a good neighbor to like accommodate and alleviate the infrastructure that we have around here so that the existing community will not have issues with sewer or storm drain backing up into their houses. Again, you're designing your project to code. No one is doing something here crazy and not following the orders. But it's about being a good neighbor. And look at these things and consider them, upgrade your systems. And, and I think that, at least in my box, would be a good compromise. Thank you. Enjoy my time. Thank you so much. Josephine Beckman, our district manager. I'm sorry, I just have a, two quick questions. Um, the first question is, is parking currently restricted to only the residents of the building so that doctors, visiting nurses, um, other, uh, other workers in the building, are they permitted to park in the parking lot currently? <clears throat> you mentioned something about stickered parking, yes, which didn't exist. I've never recalled that before. That's why I was a little taken aback. Okay, the parking lot is opened, and a lot of outside cars were taking up a lot of the residents' spaces. And the residents had complained and said that they have to walk to the end to Colonial to park their car with packages. So we got together and we notified people to please not park in the lot because the residents uh, would like to park closer to the building. So when we did do this, we contacted our residents and they came down with their registration that they do live here, their car is registered here, and we gave them a tag and we allowed our residents to park there. So that was 43 That's parking 30, spaces. You were saying the 43 30, people no. didn't fit into 73 spaces. It's, 30, it's 36 spaces for okay. our residents. Right. Okay. Then we have the commercial space. The doctors, they have spaces, a few spaces, I think. How many like are they? Eight. 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 And then we have a few employees that, I think four, that work here, that'll park here. And that's how we came up with our number. Okay, was there ever an amendment to the plans for the initial required 112 to be reduced to 73? I just didn't see any note yeah, of it that's anywhere. A, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's, that's something that we've been uh, trying to track down. And so the original plan um, was approved saying 112 spaces. Uh, but we can't find where that they were ever built. And so we have engineers and what we can only conclude is that even though it was approved, when they actually tried to pave the parking lot, they realized there was just no way you could fit 112 spaces on that parking, that it would be dangerous, that you would, cars would be b bumping into each other. And so we, while we don't have the, um, we can't track down the information, so we've been looking everywhere for it, but to the best of our understanding is that it's the 73 spaces that were only ever built. Okay, because I just want to share with the um, board, during public notice, the district office did receive several calls from visiting nurses who said that um, once change of ownership happened, they were no longer permitted to park in the parking lot. We had some community um, associations, the Bay Ridge Center, Meals on Wheels, trucks that used to park in the parking lot were asked to leave. So, so I was, I, uh, well, they, they, they can't access the um, parking lot any longer. So those were, those are reasons, um, why I asked that question, because it seemed like there was a change in policy of usage of the parking lot recently. That's Jane, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, Dean? 
Good evening. My name is Dean Rossinia, former chair of the board. Uh, my concern, besides the parking that's immediately before us, is the sewer system. And with an additional, I think it's 137 residents, I would like you to look at the sewer system that's here now, work with the city, and see if we need an upgrade. Because we have residents that are living here now who have spent tens of thousands of dollars in the past to address back up from the sewers into their homes. So this is something that should be addressed now. If we need major infrastructure work, we should address it now. And uh, we're going to depend on you to reach out to the city, look at what we have, and see if that has to be upgraded. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I just want to add to Dean's comments. Um, this section of Colonial Road is also on the New York City Department of Environmental Protection's flood maps because of flooding problems in the area. Of course. I live several blocks away on Shore Road. It's a six-story building. When it rains heavily, the first floor is flooded. So I can imagine how these multi-story buildings will fare during a heavy storm. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any other committee members who wish to speak at this time? Okay. Um, we ju I just want to reiterate once again. As a community board, we have heard numerous times about the issues with sewers, the issues with flooding, and how that affects our residents, our neighbors. You are our neighbors, and we don't want anyone to experience those types of issues and problems. And so we are keenly aware of it, and that is why we will keep reiterating and pressing that this has to be something to take into consideration for our neighbors, for our residents in the community. The other part that I have to say is when I see that last bullet you have, available legal street parking, I have to tell you, I get flashbacks to when my GPS tells me it'll take 10 minutes to get to Manhattan because it's just not going to happen. And what you've put up there seems to be more fictional than factual for a resident of Bay Ridge. Okay, so now that our board has, uh, our committee has no further comments, we are going to be calling on the members of the public who have signed up to speak. And our first member who has signed up to speak is Joseph Keeler from the 1973 New York City Planning Board. He was the chair of the New York City Planning Board 10 when this was coming to be. So please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've fought high rise in this community for many, many years. As Councilman Gentilly knows, I fought against Shore Hill, not because of his senior housing, but because it was too high for the building around the community. I had it reduced. I met with Chairman Zuccotti, God rest his soul, and at Tiffany Diner, he says, okay, Joe, what do you want? And I drew two, two triangle-shaped buildings, L-shaped buildings, with a commissary on site. And that's what's exactly built today. I oppose this new plan because, again, it would create more density in the area, and that's the reason I'm posing it this time. I thank you for your time, and appreciate the chairman for giving me this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. And next, we will welcome a dear friend of ours, Vinny Gentilly. Thank you, uh, Chair Lady. Uh, Tanakis. I want to, yeah, maybe I'll just yeah. move out here a little bit. Okay. First of all, I want to thank the members of Community Board 10 and particularly the staff and the, and the members of this committee and all of Community Board 10 because I know, I know how you have seriously considered this application and how you've looked at it and analyzed it for many, many hours. So I, I on behalf of all of us, I say thank you. Thank you for the, the good work um, that you've done. You've really done a, a great job. So I'm going, should I, uh, should I turn this way? Or? 
Okay, okay. Now, there was a day when I didn't need these to look at my notes, but those days are over, so I'm going to have to put my, uh, put my glasses on. You know, Bay Ridge uh, has a host of senior centers. We have so many food programs for seniors, transportation for seniors, um, and we're excited about the new and expanded home of the Bay Ridge Seniors, uh, the Bay Ridge Center for Older Adults, which is opening on 69th Street and Shore Road in the months to come. Now, I say all this because I, I, I just want to make it clear for the record that Bay Ridge is senior friendly, and that includes senior housing. These two Shore Hill buildings, these buildings that are here, are a testament to the neighborhood's concern for senior housing. And our ancestors, as you've heard, our ancestors have worked at a compromise plan in 1974 with the original owners of Shore Hill, so this complex could become reality today. And Joe, you were part of that, right? Back, back then. And, and it's the same throughout New York City. Um, as well. Helping seniors live out their lives in New York City is really a citywide commitment and that's why many of my colleagues and I on the council supported the amend amendments called ZQA, Zoning for Quality and Affordability, which could give more flexibility and rules for building senior housing, but only when appropriate. ZQA under which this parking waiver is made does not grant this waiver automatically. This is not an automatic granting of the waiver. The rules require the applicant's waiver request be appropriate by meeting four conditions. In this matter, the application is not appropriate because this proposal fails on three of those four conditions. The City BSA Board under Zoning Regulation 73-734 must evaluate all four factors and all four must be met before the BSA can grant the applications, uh, the applicant's request for a waiver. One condition the law requires the applicant to show is that a parking reduction will facilitate an improved site plan. In this regard, consider this, a 50% reduction in parking from 112, and 112 is the legal number that, uh, that this building was required to put up when it was built. 112 is the legal number. So the 50% reduction in parking spaces from 112 to 56 is really not the whole story. The rest of the story is that a nine-story construction of 137 new apartments by law would require 14 additional parking spaces be provided for the new building. However, the applicant has invoked a zoning regulation exception that waives the requirement of adding spaces for new development if the additional parking required is 15 spaces or less. They've invoked this waiver and they intend to, uh, to use it. So we lose the 56 spaces from the original 112, and we also lose the additional 14 spaces for parking at the new building. So in total, we, uh, 70 parking spaces are lost if this new building is constructed. Clearly, the only outcome of losing 70 parking spaces will be destructive and not improve the original site plan. It will directly and indirectly cause havoc to the residents and staff working here. And there are more reasons why the site plan will not improve the addition, uh, will not be improved with the addition of a nine-story building. And why is that? Well, you'll hear from the residents tonight, you've heard them already, some of them, that the flooding and sewage backups already occur on properties on 91st Street, Colonial Road, um, and, and Shore Road. And this is not a production of somebody's imagination or prediction of what is coming. It's already here. It's happening already. It, it is a reality. Um, you'll hear also how adding more drainage and sewage lines, no matter what the presentation here has said tonight, because I don't sure it really convinced anybody, that a 26% increase in residents on site at Shore Hill can only have one impact, 
make the flooding and the sewage backups worse. Finally, under this site plan, the site adds 137 new apartments, but doesn't provide for any improvements or expansion of the community facility, which is the building we're in. We're in the community facility. Cramming more residents into a community room like this one, or an activity room, until it uh, will make it worse for all residents once you add the new building. One amenity that they have here at Shore Hill is lunch. They serve lunch to, uh, to the seniors. There's no provision for feeding or serving 50, 60, or more additional seniors for lunch. And this room is, uh, is already crowded for lunch. I've been here. I've seen it. This room is packed at, at lunchtime. So it will be a nightmare for seniors with the new building trying to eat lunch here or do anything in already two small community rooms. So no, the parking reduction does not facilitate and improve the site plan. So the applicant fails to meet this condition. Under the law, the applicant also must demonstrate that the reduction will not cause traffic congestion. <laughs> However, with 70 fewer spaces than what should be if the new building is, is constructed, it's not hard to conclude that a reduction will have a real negative impact on traffic congestion uh, as, as motorists, that's the, the, the staff and the residents, circle the streets looking for parking. Nevertheless, the applicant has invoked the, uh, the separate waiver for additional parking at the new building because they claim studies show those spaces are unnecessary. They claim in the study, they claim that in the study at peak parking demand, the new building would need only 11 spaces. How realistic is that? Think about it. In a fully staffed nine-story building, with 137 apartments, only 11 spaces are needed at park at peak demand. I mean, that is really an outlandish and unrealistic claim that they're they're relying on. The applicants go on to say that their study shows that currently, today, the maximum use of parking spaces at Shore Hill is 43 spaces at the peak demand. And then they add the 11 spaces they say is the maximum demand at peak for the new building. And that gives you, they claim, a total peak demand of 54 spaces. Then they conclude that the 54 spaces are covered by the 56 spaces that they propose. What's the analysis on this? Even if we accept their study and numbers of peak demand, their claim is really a foolhardy position and makes no sense because they're okay with two parking space margin before parking capacity is reached because it only takes two cars under their plan to fill up the parking lot in parking capacity at peak and if that is so if that is so then searching and circling for street parking will be inevitable so this plan will turn an already bad situation for on-street parking worse and traffic circling the neighborhood worse as, we, as you'll hear from, as you've heard already from neighbors who struggle now, who struggle now to find parking each and every day, each and every night. So clearly any reduction in the required parking at this site will cause traffic congestion in the community by making the availability of street parking worse and the traffic circling around looking for it worse. So the, appli the application fails on this condition also. The last condition under the law, the applicant must show that no undue adverse effects uh, are, uh, happen on residents, businesses, or community facilities in the area as a result of the parking waiver. <clears throat> well, consider this building, nine stories tall as proposed. You'll hear Tonight, I believe they're here, I'm not sure they're here, but the Guild for Exceptional Children has a community facility on Colonial Road, right near the proposed building. And you will, you are, good, okay, great, great, that's good. Oh, next door, it's next door, okay, it's next door. Is the Guild here? Is the, okay, good. Okay, 
So you'll hear from the Guild tonight uh, how this this proposal will affect their community facility, the residents they have right here on, on Colonial Road. Uh, you heard about the medical facilities and the needs that the medical facilities have and their community facilities also. And you also hear from uh, local residents on the adverse impact this building uh, will have on the enjoyment, just the enjoyment of their property. Uh, and in, in changing the ambiance of Colonial Road with a big behemoth nine-story structure right on the streetscape. Now, the applicants will rebut this by saying, this is our 7A zoning. We can build more. That, but that argument uh, that these current towers are below the allowable floor area race, ratio is irrelevant if this application fails to meet the conditions of zoning regulation section 73434. So with significant adverse effects on the residents and on the community facility, this application fails on this condition also. And finally, the two documents we talked about that are filed with New York City in 1974 bar the granting of this application. In 1974, the owners of Shore Hill redesigned they, the original owners redesigned this building to address the residents' concerns over the original uh, uh, proposal. This community agreement was memorialized in a letter uh, the original owners sent to the city's board of estimate in 1974. The con and so the concerns of those residents back in 74 are just as valid today as they were back then. And the, uh, and we have today at Shore Hill, what we have here today at Shore Hill is really the result of those negotiations and accommodations memorialized in that community, that written community agreement. Also, in 1974, the City Planning Commission approved the construction of these two towers that we have here today, but they did so with conditions that they made clear on their authorization document allowing these buildings to go up. One of those conditions under the document states, any alter, and quote, any alteration in the premises or in the manner of operation without authorization by the City Planning Commission shall cause an immediate termination of the special permit authorization herein granted. So for these reasons, that the applicant must meet all four conditions of zoning regulation 73-434 and yet it fails in three of those four conditions, and that BSA cannot grant this application without violating the 1974 agreement and the, 19, uh, the, the community agreement and the 1974 city planning resolution. It's for these reasons that the application for reduction in required parking should be denied. A CB10 vote, I must say a CB10 vote, Reflecting this position will go a long way in communicating to the Board of Standards and Appeals that they must reject this application. And again, the community thanks you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we welcome, next we welcome Joseph Riley. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Riley, and I'm the uh, executive director for the Guild for Exceptional Children. Uh, we've been part of the fabric of the Bay Ridge community since 1958, and um, we operate. Thank you. We're your neighbors, and uh, we've been good neighbors, and uh, we operate a number of facilities here in Bay Ridge, um, none of which we would have operated without the blessing of this community board. Because each time, each time we came before you, and we asked, and we made our case, and people asked questions, and you welcomed us with open arms, which we are very grateful for, but if you hadn't, we would not have opened a facility. Because it's very important to us that we get along with our neighbors, and that we, we fit into the fabric of the community. Um, about 30 years ago, we opened a uh, residence 
for 11 developmentally disabled adults at 8910 Colonial Road, which abuts the corner of this property where the new building monolith um, is going to be assembled. Um, I am concerned as, as the director of the agency, first of all, for the impact that's going to have on the people who live in, that, in, our, in our home. Uh, these are 11 developmentally disabled, intellectually developmentally disabled individuals who are medically frail and who are prone to, to be upset with major changes in their lives. That's been their home for 30 years. Now they're going to suffer through the noise of a gigantic building being built. They're going to live in the shadow of this mountain where sun will no longer shine on their home. Um, and uh, I'm concerned for their mental and physical well-being. I'm concerned for their safety. A lot of issues were addressed tonight, and I think a lot more will be. Um, I'm also speaking on behalf of all of our neighbors, because this doesn't seem like it's going to be good for any of you. I, you know, I heard what was said. No one really believes those available street parking numbers that were kind of fabricated and put up on that board. Uh, we know. You know, we're all here every day. We know what it's like to try and park. It seems, it seems interesting that people were banned from parking in the lot immediately before the study was done where they, where they decided, oh, we don't need all these spots. Um, I think that's an interesting timing thing. Um, we all know about the flooding. We are in a flood zone and there's been talk from the engineers about runoff and all that stuff. It's not just runoff. A point was made about the hundreds of toilets that are going to be flushing and the showers that are going to be running that are going to overtax, the already overtax sewer system, right? Um, it, it, it's a difficult area to manage that water. Um, I am concerned for the safety of the people who live in that home and I'm going to be very vigilant because if this project were to go through and anything happens to one person, it, it's go, no one will ever hear the end of it. I, uh, I think um, people have mostly spoken about the parking, but I also wanted to say one more word about the congestion. It's not just the lack of parking, but it's all of the, the vehicles that, will, that are going to be servicing now the new facility. You have, um, you have assessor rides that are be coming at all hours of, of the day and night. You're going to have the Meals on Wheels programs. You're going to have staff that can, can't park in the lot because there's not enough room for them. You're going to have um, a lot of congestion on all the streets that are already congested. That also creates a safety. Ambulances. Right and people visiting their parents. So it's going to become a, you know, we won't have to worry about parking spaces because the whole area is going to become a parking lot and no one's going to be able to get around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, um, I just wanted to put my two cents in as, as your neighbors, you know, and you've been good neighbors to us. I'm concerned and I, I f this project must be reimagined. Thank you. Thank you so much. As we continue, we have about another uh, 18 speakers who have signed up to speak. We ask you if you can kindly limit your uh, remarks to two minutes. We'll be calling speakers. I'll ask for two people to come up at a time so that when one person is speaking, the next person can be on deck. So this way we can help you all. So we can now would like to invite up Paul Francis. And if we could ask James Coppola, you will be next. OK? So please welcome Paul Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to say anything that the uh, previous speakers said already. Um, the survey that was taken, I don't know what time of day it was taken or if it was taken during, uh, I don't know if it was taken during, you know, alternate side parking, but I know myself, I have cameras in front of my house. I have a year's worth of footage that you could go on day or night and you won't see one available spot. We have people parking on our driveway. We have people double parking. 
the congestion already is, is ridiculous. Anybody who has a ring doorbell can go on right now and show you there's not one spot available. All right, the sewage that's coming up through our basement, like a geyser, it's feces, it's, it's sewage, it's not runoff. I congratulate you for being, wanting to build green and everybody's gonna have a window and you're gonna have a yard to play in and you're all gonna have beautiful sun. <laughs> You don't have to build a building to fix your garbage cans. You show me garbage cans that are like, have no tops on them, and that's why we gotta build nine stories. That's, that's, I don't understand that. You have stairs that are too steep to get down. Change the stairs, put a ramp. Don't put a nine story building. The guild is gonna be in a shadow, day and night. When I spoke last time on the Zoom, I was told that I won't be that affected by the sun in the evening. And, you know, just, just in the evening, I won't be that affected. It's, there's no sun studies that are needed to be taken for the neighbors. I mean, that's just for a few of us. But for everybody else that's walking around in their house, you know, the storms come in at 3 o'clock in the morning. When we're ankle deep in feces because the sewers can't handle it, we don't want to hear about runoff. We, we just don't want 200 toilets and showers and everything else that, that, that was said. In your picture, you don't show any hung electrical lines. Where are the, where's the electric that's running down the street right now? You said they might be telephone lines. They're not telephone lines. They're electric lines. You don't show them in any one of your photos. They're all, they're all not there. What's going to happen? Are you going to dig up the whole entire street and bury them? What impact does that have on everybody that lives on Colonial Road in 91st Street? You know you can't put a building up with hung electric. Where are all these answers? What are we gonna do? We're gonna find out after we start breaking ground when Rudy, who lives next door to me at the Guild, is going crazy because there's, there's noise from seven in the morning all the way into the afternoon. This is just not right. It's a wonderful project and we all love seniors. No one here is gonna say they don't want a house for seniors. We all have seniors in our family. We love this, not here. This is not the spot. We don't have the parking. We don't have the means. You could have a hundred civil engineers. How many days did you take surveys for parking? Do you have that answer? How many? Seven days. Wow. What time was it? No, what date? What date? No, no, no. What date and time? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Those numbers are those numbers. Every single person. This is make believe. Every single person here says that those numbers are wrong. One hundred percent of the people here, unless you're building it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ninety-nine percent of the people here will say that those don't make sense. No, they put up cameras. No, I'm just yeah. I'm yeah. How far. They said five Listen, my, minute walk. They said a five minute a walk. A five minute. How far is it? What they say is a five minute walk could be 10 blocks. It could be all the way up to Third Avenue. Five minutes is short. Listen, the, the impact that this is going to have on all of these people in this neighborhood is going to be immense. Immense. If it was only during the construction, we'd grin and bear it 100%. But it's not. It's going to be the duration forever. If the building goes up, these will be problems forever. It's already a problem. You, you were supposed to have 112 and it's, what, 75? Those just, when the buildings were put up, those disappeared into the, into the air. Nobody could find them anymore. No, just, they just don't exist. Right? It's already a problem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Next, we welcome James Coppola, and he will be followed by, if I can ask Antoinette, Valenti to come up. Good evening. Um, I'm looking at these numbers, and I would just like to double check them. And we can do a, a quick walk right now, and let's go count the 53 spaces. And you know what, you guys, if the four can step up, and we'll go four different directions for five minutes, and we'll count to 53. Could we do that? No, nobody wants to do that, right? Because we're going to find the truth. 
these numbers are just make believe. It's 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 not fair to the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we will welcome Antoinette. And next up will be Joseph in the Murado. If you could come up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Good evening. Uh, I just have a few comments here. Um, okay. Everyone else pretty much took care of the outside, the environment, and all of that. I'm a geriatric nurse. I've been a nurse over 40 years. I'm currently a senior. I would just like you to look around, and the people that are living here, most of us are now seniors. The stress, this, and this is a naturally occurring retirement community, Bay Ridge, and uh, uh, seniors are one of the central focus. So I just want to let you know here, the stress that I hear coming from uh, my own age group and myself included, I think you should be aware of. Now, everybody's talking about the outside. As a geriatric nurse, and I've worked in several facilities in my career, what about the inside? Um, are this architectural firm that's doing this, are you geriatric centered? I mean, has there been any consult with geriatric people? Because one of the things that's happened, I've worked in old buildings and new buildings, is sometimes you think you've got the best plans, and then when it actually happens, it's really not. So, and, and one of the other things is uh, a lot of times you're mentioning about all the green space and all of that kind of stuff. It's not really all that necessary. And maybe you want it not to not do it, but reconsider your design where you might include parking underneath the facility or uh, the types of units and what kind of services. And it's upsetting to hear already that the lunchroom, which is critical food to the, you know, to the elderly, might be compromised and there might not be. So I wasn't prepared. I had no idea except for the fact that we don't want it for these obvious reasons. But there's a whole slew, if I knew, I would have come prepared with all these little pointers because you're making a huge investment and then might it be not really the right thing. So I just want to just say it sounds great, but I don't know. I'd be happy to discuss it with you further. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next, as I said, we have Joseph in the Murado. Yes. And, and I would ask Paulette Manos to please come up. You will be next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not that I'm a great speaker, but what I have is uh, aggravation. And what I'm trying to do is... In front of our block on 91st Street, we have so much congestion that won't let ambulances come through. Second of all, we have all the minivans that park in our driveways, and we're very accommodating to the seniors because they're seniors, and we'll let them park in front of our driveways to get out. Even though you have access in your own backyard to use your handicap ramps to let the people in, they park in our driveways, and we let them do that. The, right, the drivers are rude, but they're not your employees, so you can't do nothing about the drivers. Second thing is, when we do, we end up having a daycare center in front of all our houses, and they all come, take the sun in front of all our houses, and again, we have to um, you know, tell them to move, which is not accommodating to the seniors, and we feel bad for that, but we gotta pull out of our driveways, and a lot of them don't wanna really move too fast. So it inhibits us from all pulling out of our cars from our driveways. No one in this building really cares. We go to management. Management takes care of it for two days, and then we're back at the same thing. Building that building on Colonial Road, we already spoke about parking. We already spoke about sewers. We already spoke about backups. No one's chipping in to help us with the backups and the sewers. It's all on us. And the parking, those numbers don't make sense because... You can't take 112 spots and make it into 33, and that's because you don't allow any more decals for the, your employees to even park there because your management parks on the street, which I know your management parks on the street, and there's three employees that park on the street. You should let them park in your parking lot to alleviate three more spots for the people that live on the block. So, you know, your numbers saying only 41 and 53 spots overnight, Right now, there's 75 spots already taken just on this block, so I don't know where 53 came from. But Community Board 10 and uh, 
Mr. Assemblyman Gentile should really reject this whole order. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we welcome Paulette Manos, if, and if I could ask Jay Mandolino to please come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's not much I can add. Everybody has the same complaint I have. But just to add to the complaints is the other factor is uh, sometimes in the middle of the night, I have the, uh, made the mistake of putting my bedroom in the front. You have the ambulance lights that come in. You hear people, aides picking people up. They talk. The, their voices carry right to the bedroom, 4 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they honk their horn. They come in blasting their music. So not only will this create more of a problem with the quality of our life, but the quality of life now kind of stinks. They're, every day, I'm, now I'm retired, so I'm in and out all day long. And 10 times in and out, 10 times my driveway is blocked. 10 times somebody's double parked, triple parked, and I can't even get up to go past them to get into my driveway. So quality of life now is kind of lousy. And the flooding. We flood. We just spent a lot of money to uh, re-cement our backyards so at least we can go down the driveway and get rid of some of the water because literally, I used to have to swim to get to my car in my backyard because we have a, you know, a shared driveway. It was insane. So uh, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed. But life right now isn't that sweet on the block, 91st Street, right across the street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we welcome Jay Mandolino. And next will be Maria Petsis and Julie Corbicero. We're coming up together. And for, to all of our speakers, our uh, cameraman reminded us, please be sure to hold the microphone near, where, near your mouth when you're speaking. Thank you so much. I don't appreciate when professionals come up here and talk about water runoff and everything. Do we have a combined sewer out there? So as a professional, why didn't we speak about the sewer also? We only talked about rainwater and stormwater runoff. You came here to present to us. We were telling you we're flooding. You never took into consideration the bathrooms and everything. It's like something you try to put under in the stormwater plan. It doesn't work that way. The stormwater management plan just takes care of rainwater. You talk about permeable parking spots. That could be corrected right now. You could put the asphalt out there. You could put green roofs on top of the parking lot and make it all accessible to the people here so they can have recreation. And that driveway has been shut here for a long time. Every assessor and everything that comes out there to help the people has to double park, has to block our driveways, and they're not even allowed in to drop people off by the ramp. It's, it's getting to be the point of ridiculous. And you say you care and you're trying to work it out with the neighborhood. You're not doing it by keeping the driveway shut and not letting them in to drop people off. And there was one more thing I had to tell you. When was that survey done? I seen April 22. It wasn't the week everyone's on vacation and away in Florida, is it? <laughs> Maybe you cracked the case. Thank you. We will one, now welcome Maria and Julie. And next up will be Christopher Patsos. Thank you. All the problems that the, the people mentioned are real problems. I'm going to mention only the problem that I face. I live on Shore Court, right behind these buildings. And as you know, Colonial Road, they have big problem with the sewers. I live at the end of the private street, Shore Court, and the water, the, the water from the sewers, they used to come all the way up to the end. As a private, as a private street, the city never, never helped on, any, on, any, on anything. We had to fix the problem only on Shore Court, and we spent not, that, not, not a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, as Mr. Asinia mentioned. We spent a hundreds thousands. We do have the bills, and you know, uh, available. So I like to know uh, who is going to be responsible. And who is going to guarantee that we're not going to have problems in the future? And if we do have problems, who is going to pay? Who is going to pay for, for the problems? Because as we face it in the past, cost a hundred thousand dollars, a hundreds, not a hundred, not ten thousand and twenty. I live on a short court, and my neighbor Julie yeah. lives yeah. right next to yeah. me. No. Uh, but um, we, we have a problem with the sewer, 
and the water backs up and it's really bad. Um, and it's only going to get worse. Even today, if you go down by Colonial Road, the entrance, entrance to Shore Court is almost in the middle between Colonial and Narrows. You're going to see water in today, today, just now. When we have a lot of water, we can't pass by. We have to go only with the cars. Thank you. So it's a big, big problem. We, got, we want you to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you once again. We now welcome Christopher Patsos, and next will be Mike Wilner. Thank you. Hey there. Uh, some of you may know me from next door. Some of you may not like me from next door. Um, I am uh, a resident at 9201 Shore Road. I'm also recently on the board. I just got voted on. Don't ask me why I did that, but I did. You know, a couple things struck me, and I know it struck the gentleman in the back there as well. These buildings that are here now presumably went through the same kind of a process 50-some years ago, and yet they have those the trash out there in the parking lot, which I, even though I live right here, I didn't even realize that. That makes no sense to me. They didn't know that they were going to have trash. And the idea that they have seniors that can't get down to the green space, again, it concerns me the fact that we're going through the same process. If they couldn't do it 50 years ago, I'm not sure how well they're going to do it this time. It's not the same people. But it really concerns me that if those mistakes were made then, what mistakes are going to be made this time? And the other thing that struck me is that I think of all the times that I come home at 9 o'clock at night looking for a space. I drop my wife off, of course, and I drive down to Fort Hamilton and I park down there because I'm only 65, so I still have legs and I can do it. But now I realize that there are 20 or 30 spaces that I could have been using <laughs> over here that have been not used for the past 50 years. I mean, what a shame. You could have rented it to me. I mean, it would have been nice if you'd said, you know what, nobody's using these because we don't allow them to be used by our employees, and there aren't enough residents, apparently, and I guess, I hate to say it, maybe people aren't visiting their moms and dads like they should be. So those spaces were there this whole time. I could have been parking there. If I may just ask the next person up after Mike will be Victoria Hoffmo. Thank you. Hi again. My name is Mike Wilner. My wife Ruth and I are new uh, homeowners here in Bay Ridge. Very interested in the well-being of the community. I do want to thank the team from Jonathan Rose for coming and presenting. It's you know it's a always a difficult topic, and uh, I, clearly they're um, willing to listen. So. I want to combine a few things. The fact that we, we discussed all this seven months ago, so that's a quite a bit of time we've all had to think this over, but especially the team that's proposing the development. It, I would just observe that over hmm, making a presentation that makes no mention of household sewage, of um, you know the the comings and goings in the parking lot that are not strictly related to the residents, and we have it ambulances, not just the residents, but their families, their health aides, the nurses, and all of that, and combine to um, create a sense of, uh, impact the credibility of the presentation. So I'll just make that observation. But everybody's made fine points uh, about those uh, concerns. I, what I, we did not hear tonight at all was, um, and I'm just consulting my notes because I too need some reminders. Um, during construction, the housing around here is not new. It's oh, most of it was built. A lot of it is built around 1925, especially adjoining structures, or before, or before. And the risk of impact damage to those houses during construction, we didn't hear anything about how that's going to be managed or avoided. Additionally. Um, excavation and construction can have impacts on water table levels. So in addition to sewage impacts and not just drainage, but the 137 new toilets and kitchen sinks and showers, etc., we are also, you know, 
looking at what, what is the impact of, of excavating for this building, rising water levels and potential basement flooding. And I got one more comment to make, then I'll wrap it up. The last is, okay, construction takes noise. We understand that. But there's also the possibility of vermin infestation that they get stirred up by the construction. We heard nothing about managing all that. So I guess after seven months, we might have expected more comprehensive and inclusive uh, presentation. So I'm a little bit surprised that we are still discussing and asking about these critical issues. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now as we welcome Victoria, the next up will be Seth R Rind. Rind, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just really have one brief comment. I'm very much involved with zoning issues in the neighborhood, and I feel very strongly that we live in a very special neighborhood, and it's because we have mixed economics, and that's because of our housing stock. And also, we have such beautiful access to parkland. We're very lucky that way. Mm -hmm. So I feel very strongly that we respect that, and unfortunately that doesn't happen often. So I have been wondering how this actually came to even be since I wasn't old enough really to be involved with the first project. I was alive, but not, you know, part of that. And I, I had heard there was some kind of stipulation that nothing else could be built on the site. So I don't understand why, if that were the case, this is even an issue, why we're building on this site and why we're not respecting what was already negotiated originally, which was already a huge compromise for this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we will ask Seth to come up, and after him will be Joanna Joseph. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, I'm going to first start with something completely different, and then I'll go with the other part. So you're building this site, and you're doing it. Has anybody looked at the new values of what these properties are going to look like after the site is built? I mean, what the change of the value of all these houses the places for everybody. Most of this is people's retirement money, and this is their lives. I mean, has anybody looked at a survey to say, if we build this, will the values go down? Will they go up? And especially, with, will it go down? And how much will it go down? It could go down $100,000, $200,000. That's people's retirement. That's their lives. Did anybody do a survey to even look at it? Did anybody do a survey? Forget about the parking that we all know about, the sewer we all know about and all this, but the other residents that you're saying. You're saying the Section 8 people. You're saying all this. How's that going to affect our neighborhood? Are they going to have cars? Are they going to have kids? What problems there? Nobody's done. All you're doing is saying is, we're putting 135 people here. This is where it is because you're going to look to make money, okay, and do the sites. You're saying us we're going to fix up all these areas and all this. You could do that without building the 135 things. Now you also said part of your presentation, oh, we're going to have outside movies and we're going to have barbecues. That's going to affect everybody here with barbecues, noise, and all that. Now, has anybody come here during Thanksgiving, Christmas areas? You can't find a parking spot around here because people are coming to visit their, their parents, or picking up their parents at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. You'll see double park of 35 people there. You can't even go down 91st Street. You can't even go on Colonial because all the people are double parked, seeing their parents and all that. And you don't even let the people use your parking lot who work here. Now you have 135 more things. That means you have to have more staff. How many more staff are you going to have? How many more people are you going to have? That's additional parking. You're going to say nobody's going to be driving here? Okay? You have sewers. This was done half-ass. Okay? Let, let's put a spade a spade. This was done half-ass. You're doing a presentation, but you're not looking at the cause and effect. And the value of properties for everybody here is their livelihoods. Okay? They spent a lot of money. They've lived here a long time. And that's their livelihoods. People, if they want to retire, if they want to stay here, or if they want to retire, they sell it. That's what they're going to be living on for the rest of their lives. So if values go down, and with interest rates going up, the values are going down right now. So it's going to be a double effect on people. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Joanna Joseph. She will be followed by Jennifer Seidel. So you said that in your proposal, part of your proposal is to make a greener environment for the community. 
and the staff, the people that will be living here. By you making a greener community for the people who will be coming here, you're not making it for the people who already live here and who have invested 20 years in this area. These senior citizens have paid their taxes, they have indulged in everything, and we are very welcoming to everybody here. All the, everybody said it before, the seniors come and they sit in front. I sit and sometimes I talk with them. Rudy, who is at the Gilded, is one of my best friends. And if you put up a building that will block the sun from him, do you know, the, do you know what you're going to do to him mentally? I really think you need to rethink this. Because your idea f to make it beautiful for everybody who doesn't live here anymore at, at all will make it really bad for the people who do. So, so, so just think about that. Thank you so much. Next we will have Jennifer followed by Karen Dome. Hi, uh, I have a quick question and I hope this isn't going to take away from my two minutes. Um, so you're applying for a parking permit and if this council doesn't approve this permit, then this project cannot go forward as it's designed right now. Is that the case? No. All right, so what happens if you don't get the parking permit? I didn't understand, sorry. I'll just explain the process as I understand it. So the applicant is going to... Um, put in an application to the Board of Standards and Appeals. Okay. They're the entity that will review their request to reduce the parking um, that is required for the slot. There is parking that is required, and it's not as right as, as uh, Mr. Gentile said. So if they obtain by the Board of Standards and Appeals that special permit, then they could proceed to the Department of City Planning for another modification application, and then they will get the green light to... to um, to build. This body is the community board and we have an advisory role. So we will tell, we will share an opinion, our opinion to advisory, it's not binding, with the Board of Standards and Appeals on what our recommendation is for their consideration. But ultimately it is the Board of Standards and Appeals that has the final say. And there is another opportunity for public comment at their process as well. And we'll find out about that. Yes, you will. Okay. So uh, my name is Jennifer Siddell. I've been in Bay Ridge my entire life. I went to St. Pat's. I graduated from Fompon. And I am now a homeowner on 91st Street, just a couple of ways away, right? Just, just down the, the block. So I just want to say I love the seniors. I love living on this block with all these seniors. Like, it's so cool to, like, be able to say hi to them and good morning. I walk my dog every day and like, like they're like my friends, okay? Like I really do love it, okay? But now this whole proposal is very scary and I just want to read an email that I wrote to Justin Brannon and I don't know if he sent representation here today. Okay, awesome. So like I'm gonna read the email that I sent you and thank you for coming, okay? I know he went to, to Fort Allen High School, okay? So, um, so the expansion of the Shore Hill housing complex is going to affect numerous homeowners in the surrounding area. I reached out to your office, Justin, uh, sorry, uh, a few years back, okay? This is before this whole thing was proposed that I knew was gonna happen. So a few years back, I reached out to him because of the whole parking situation and, and the congestion on the block. So um, right now, uh, so I was asking him to hopefully talk to the owners of this building to see if they could set up a designated pickup and drop off area for their residents because the parking situation and the pickup, everything like people blocking my driveway, it's, it's insane, right? So uh, two years ago I asked them for this and um, I was hoping something would happen but you know, nothing ever did. I know how, the, how these things go. So I said, um, uh, a private company, private company delivery drivers, sorry my, okay, private company delivery drivers, adult daycare vans, bus drivers, car service drivers, and family members of Shore Hill residents all routinely block homeowner drivers on 91st Street, double park, they leave their vehicles, and this creates not only a nuisance for the homeowner, but additional traffic and noise and litter, right? Uh, another very alarming trend that I've noticed just in the past couple weeks is Bottles of urine, bags of urine on this block left by these drivers that like have to sit out there waiting for the residents, right? I'm sorry, I'm gonna go into my two minutes here. So, um, so who's gonna clean this up? Me, 
Okay? The person who lives in front of this bottle of urine has to pick up this unsanitary, disgusting garbage. Okay? And that's, this neighbor, like, this is unheard of. Like, that's insane, right? So, um, I can only assume these problems will become exponentially worse once this, you know, building expansion happens. Uh, I think the only solution, and now this is what I'm begging for, this is the only, if this happens, if it's going to happen, I'm just begging, please, a designated pickup and drop off area. You got a parking lot that has two entrances, one exit, one entrance. You could have one way traffic go through and have a safe, dedicated spot for these people to be picked up, for these people, I shouldn't say it that way, my neighbors to get picked up and dropped off, right? Oh, and another thing, I know I look young, okay? I'm not as young as I look. I'm probably not the youngest person here. This young gentleman over here was imploring you guys, trying to appeal to your integrity. Be a good neighbor, be a good neighbor. You guys don't live here, okay? I am not counting on you guys being good neighbors to me. I'm counting on these lovely people here. I'm very nervous, my voice is cracking. I went over my two minutes, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as Karen comes up to speak, next will be Jacob Goldfinger. Hi, I'm Karen Dome. I'm a neighbor on 89th Street, so, and I've lived here all my life. Uh, I'm also a real estate broker, and I can tell you the way this is designed, the value of our homes are going to go down. I've been doing it 30 years, so I can tell you that for a fact. Uh, I had some questions, which was, uh, the dimension of the building, frontage and, and such, where I can find out that exact information, as well as the 56 existing parking spaces. If the board votes to not approve this plan, does that still remain exactly as it is, and you're going to proceed with the project? And if so, when is the projected timing of the completion of this project? Um, I also... The reason for the 30% homeless seniors, why did we decide on that versus just assisted living, which is currently what it is? Um, again, and then again, I'm confident that significant, well, again, 30% homeless is a significant number for a small facility such as this. Um, and also, I think it is going to have a significant impact on the neighborhood character. The sewer and the parking, as everyone has discussed, absolutely, positively, even on 89th Street, we have no parking. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a driveway, but literally all my neighbors can't find parking that literally I save spot. So someone comes home with a disabled child, has a parking spot. Uh, in addition to that, like I said, the sewer, uh, my sewer backed up as well. I just replaced all the sewer pipes. Uh, and again, you know, we care about this community and, and we love the seniors. I have an 87-year-old mother, so no one loves seniors more than I do and have the utmost respect for seniors. But we also, again, value our value of our real estate here like this is our livelihood and what we have done. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as we welcome Jacob, next up will be Martin Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's a person in this room or anyone who lives in this community who doesn't understand the severe need for more senior housing. And I hope uh, the board will support this development. Not only do we need it, we need a lot more of it. Uh, I drive in Bay Ridge, park on the street. I got a ticket just, just this week. It's a pain. Uh, my desire for free parking should not supersede the need for senior housing. Um, the developers have shown that the existing parking lot is severely underused by the residents. In, in fact, there, there are neighbors who exploit that free resource and have been parking on that lot, even though they don't live there. Some people might refer to that as free riding. Um, the proposed lot uh, provides capacity 30% above what they've shown is the peak use, 
and I think it's very generous. Um, one thing I know about 1974 is that it was 48 years ago. And what made sense then doesn't make sense now. The Board of Estimate was disbanded 33 years ago. Things change. But I am confident that the residents of this building will be able to get lunch and that the sun will continue to shine on Shore Road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Marty. Next, we welcome Martin Murphy. And next, after he speaks, will be Lisa Sokolow. Thanks so much. Thanks. I'll try and be very quick. Um, when uh, uh, Joe Keeler introduced himself, it brought me back many years. Uh, I go back to when there was an empty lot here. And uh, uh, the uh, you know Norwegian Hospital which now is Lutheran Medical Center, and uh, it, they, they own the land and they propose this. But one of the selling points, and there was a lot of uh, arguing about it, a lot of people did not want a, a high rise in Bay Ridge on the shore. But Joe Keeler reminded me that the, one of the selling points and the reason it was built was that they were, the senior citizens that were gonna move in here were from this area. Now, what bothers me is in the last 50 years, uh, the city's come up with all kinds of regulations. Uh, many of them have to do with the politics that go on in Manhattan, not, in Bay, in, in, not really what we need in Bay Ridge. And the two things that really got me very worried were the 30% senior homeless provision and the, the mention of Section 8, and those are very, very dangerous ideas, and I would like them to be explained more uh, to, uh, to our satisfaction anyway. Is the governor of Texas going to be sending a bus here? <laughs> Lisa Sokolo will be coming up to speak, and then we will ask Elisa Cassidy to come up. Thank you. I, I didn't intend to speak today, but how many times have we seen this corporate BS play out? How many times? Um, you referred to Colonial Road as Colonial Avenue. That's an insult. Um, you're talking about shrubbery and gardens and sugar plum fairies. Uh, We've got a beautiful ridge. We've got tons of greenage here. If you bothered to look around, you'd see we're surrounded by green and dogs and families. I apologize to everyone because I was off walk working, trying to pay my mortgage and my health coverage. You know the deal. And I couldn't make those posters. So I was, I was busy. So I, I do apologize. Um, I'm very insulted. My question is, what about us? You refer to us in your beautiful presentation as the smaller houses on the outside. Smaller houses on the outside. We're not the smaller houses on the outside. We're people in those houses. We're people. Okay? We're people. I hear parking spaces. You know what I'm worried about? Health. How many times are we lied to? How many times? It's clean under your house, right? Don't worry about it. We were, we were lied after 9-11, right? It's clean, don't worry about it. There's no way that's gonna be clean, that there's not gonna be stuff released into the air, that asthma isn't gonna go up, that cancer is not going to go up. There's no way. Okay, that, that is your, you don't live in the area. This here, but yours has a couple of more zeros on it. That's what you're motivated by. That's what you're motivated by, you know? Come in and, and say it. And again, you know, I, I really, it's not in your neighborhood. It's not in your neighborhood. We're very happy the way things are in our neighborhood, okay? We're very happy, but there's a big health concern here. And, and not only that, I, my house is on the market. And you know what? I 
can't sell it. People are spooked. Are you going to compensate me? There's one more thing I have to say. America doesn't run on Duncan. It runs on class action lawsuits. Have a good evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Elisa, thank you. Good evening. My name is Elisa Cassidy. I'm a local resident. I live around on 89th Street, local homeowner. And I'll be honest with you. I was very stressed out coming over here tonight to begin with. And I'm stressed out more than I ever thought I would have been. A couple of things. First of all, I'm sorry, but your credibility is shot as far as I'm concerned. To come here and have the nerve to show us that you think there are 153 parking spaces on a given day is flat out lies. So why should we trust you? Why should we trust anything that you say if you've already lied to our faces? The other thing that concerns me, and these are minor things, if you all could not do better in the time that you've already had, then to put that wonderful parking area to good use, you can't even manage a parking lot. And we should trust you to manage a giant project like this? I mean, it's infuriating. Why hasn't that parking lot been put to better use? You know. I don't even drive down 91st Street, and I haven't for a long time because I'm afraid there's going to be an accident. You couldn't come up with an idea to use that parking lot, as this young lady said here, for pick up and drop off before now? I mean, what have you been waiting for? You've had 48 years to run this place, and this is the best you could do? But I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm actually just about shaking as I stand here, okay? I've lived in the neighborhood, in the area, general area, my whole life. But I moved right where I live maybe about uh, 12, 13 years ago. And at that time, my older daughter could walk around in the streets. And I felt relatively comfortable for her safety at a certain age. Things have changed. I don't care what any crime statistics say. I live here. I have eyes. I look around. My younger daughter is not allowed to walk home from school by herself. And yes, that is because whether anyone wants to admit it or not, there is a homeless issue in the area already. We are at the end of the R line, and at the 95th Street Station, which is right by where she goes to school, people, people come out. And it's, it's concerning, it's frightening, it's not how it used to be. So, when you mention, which I do not remember you mentioning before, that there will be 30% given to Section 8 homeless, I'm deeply concerned. Okay? I feel like we are being banged over the head with this. I mean, how was this not mentioned until now? I know that I speak for every homeowner in this room when I tell you when we bought our houses, we bought them as an investment. A gentleman mentioned that earlier, and I think he's left, and he's 100% right. How would you like someone coming along and destroying your investments and ruining you financially? I have four children. My home is supposed to go to them and be split among them. And what will it be? A disaster. And nothing like what I thought it would be when I came here. And all of this for the special privilege of paying some of the highest tax rates in New York City. 
why don't you be more equitable and go to an area where they live in million, multi-million dollar homes and ask them to kick in and finance this? Because we are at a breaking point over here. We cannot afford to have our home values destroyed. The last thing that I want to mention, thank you, is your trash compactors. That's a special concern of mine. They abut my backyard. And again, I am talking to people who think that there are, are, you know, who lie to my face about parking, who couldn't manage a parking lot in 48 years, and I'm supposed to believe you that there's not going to be any odor from the trash compactor. Are you kidding me? What are you going to do when the wind blows it through my windows? I can only imagine what it will stink like. And we absolutely need to have an explanation about the homeless and Section 8 issue. So are you, are they able to speak about it now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn it over. Sure. There will be only one more speaker. <clears throat> so uh, on the Section 8 issue, so Section 8 is a government program that provides a rental subsidy for people so they can afford to, to make their rent. Basically the idea is the resident who has a Section 8 voucher pays only 30% of their income towards rent. The balance is made up by the federal government, okay? They, <laughs> correct. And so um, Shore Hill, our, our, the existing community, is 100% Section 8 housing. Because otherwise, many seniors can't afford to pay rents, even rents that are at affordable to people at 50% AMI, 60% AMI, like a, like a lot of affordable housing. When you're a senior and you're living on savings or just Social Security, you don't have the money in many times to, to pay rent. So a lot, what you see is a lot of section, uh, senior housing is supported by Section 8. Okay. You're not a philanthropist, you're a capitalist. Okay. No. So let's talk about the homeless part. So the 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 thirty percent homeless requirement, the set aside for homeless, is a requirement for all uh, newly built affordable senior housing that uses uh, city financing to get built. It's a response to the homelessness crisis, and it's a recognition that there are a lot of seniors who, um, who don't have anywhere to live, and we have to provide uh, housing for them, and so there's a, a set aside for that. That is, that is a policy that was established by the city. One we happen to think is a good idea because there is no neighborhood, as it's been mentioned today, that is immune from the homelessness crisis. We're, all of us as residents of the city uh, are impacted by it. What, what has been found is the... Affordable housing doesn't get built without the support of the city Good anywhere. Money. Yeah. So um, it, is a, it is a citywide policy, um, and it is, it is designed to, to um, ensure that seniors who are experiencing homelessness um, have an opportunity to get placed, so. Thank you, and once again, we welcome our last speaker, Josiah Slotnick. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to address the Community Board 10. I, you know, I think Councilman Gentili laid it out very clearly what the obligation of the applicant is, that they have to demonstrate that they've satisfied the conditions. You've heard tonight, and you've seen, about the traffic congestion, about the environmental conditions. They haven't met that burden. So I think you guys have an obligation in your role to give your advisory opinion. The applicant hasn't met their burden. So you have to say no, and then we go to the next stage. They haven't met the burden. You've heard it from all these people. And, and Councilman Gentili gave his opinion. You have to say no. And that's it.
Thank you very much. And now we will turn to our committee so that we can, I'm sorry, the, the wire is stuck. Thank you so much. So then we could uh, make our proposals. Uh, Madam President, uh, as a member of the board, I move that Community Board 10 vote to deny the application being considered and request and, I re and we request that the Board of Stands and Appeal also deny the same. I'll second that. Thank you. Yes, I, I just uh, would like to start uh, the discussion. Uh, I just want to say one thing. I think I spoke before. I think I started it out and uh, it was quite clear in my beliefs here. But what this application would do is transfer the value of the homes in this community to Shore Hill. <laughs> okay. That's what's going to happen from this. Because I believe that just about everything that you heard here tonight is accurate. And I believe that under those circumstances, we have an obligation as the community board, not the Shore Hill board, that we have to say, we don't agree. We do not want this to go forward and to make that very clear to the Board of Standards and Appeals. Uh, I think, well, I, ju I just wanted to be clear. There's something in the Constitution of the United States called eminent domain, where you take property, they say you can't do that. The government just can't come in. Well, the government has to make this decision, okay? And I believe that the decision that they're making, as I said right here, is really a decision to take property, your property, your interests in your homes, all right? and to transfer that to a private developer, okay? That's wrong, and I would never vote for it. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor for the committee to vote to deny the application and request that the Board of Appeals, Steve, I'm trying to just get the Board of Standards and Appeals agree Board of Standards and Appeals do the same. Also deny the same. That was seconded by Dean. So may we be able to take a vote now by our committee? Uh, a, a vote of aye is, uh, means that we are voting against the Shore Hill. Okay? That's correct, and in favor of the motion, okay? It was, the motion was seconded, so again, this is a motion to deny the application that was shared with us. So, do, are we able to then vote with our committee? All in favor, please raise your hand, of denying the application. If you are in favor of denying the application, okay? Ken Dorothy is doing our count. Thank you. Those who are opposed, and uh, one opposal, yes. any, any re every, that accounts for everyone here. I'm sorry, you wish to say something? Yeah, I would just say that I, 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 I'm voting in favor. If we could get them to vote on Okay. All right. So thank you very much. We have our uh, recommendation from our committee. Yes. I'm not sure what what was happened here. I want to know: is this unanimous? No. No. The motion. The motion does carry. She does. Josephine. Yes. Seven to one. Seven to one. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have a motion then to adjourn our meeting? Motion and seconded. Thank you all so much. Thank you for coming out this evening. You are the bad yourself, so I got to say, I praise you.